Uh, I am Samir Thude and uh, happy to welcome you all to this uh, lecture series special which has been uh, refreshed and renewed at Ayuka. It is called the Chandra Lecture Series, uh, Chandra Public Talks. We've had a long tradition of uh, introducing scientists to you who are working on the frontier edge of various kinds of uh, research, including particularly astrophysics, which is the uh, subject which is researched at Ayuka. And <clears throat> they take a lot of efforts to uh, clarify things which, are, which could be complicated for uh, the people who do not have a science background, but uh, they, are, uh, they have been very effective and so I know this, this lecture series is appreciated a lot. Well, we uh, try to uh, first uh, you get you to the level of the understanding of uh, some of the basic things and uh, for that our scientists uh, have uh, you know, uh, created this special talks. Yeah? And we are also going online, so I'm just uh, trying to see if, if things are working okay. I'm getting some feedback here. Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay, so to begin, uh, again, I would like to thank you all for coming despite the rain and, uh, and the holiday which has been given, right? Uh, and uh, showing interest in this lecture series. We have been able to get you a very special speaker today here on stage in this evening, uh, uh, who happens to be, you know, what uh, we would call the our local person here. Yeah? Uh, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Hansa Padmanabhan. So why I'm saying uh, that she's local to us is because uh, we've uh, seen her here at Ayuka for many years and she's a Puneite by uh, location and by heart as well. <laughs> I know uh, she has had her early education here, including her BSc and MSc in physics at the Pune University. She went on to do her PhD at Ayuka here and uh, later, of course, she's got many fellowships uh, across the world, including uh, fellowships in Canada and Switzerland, and, recent, and her recent position at the University of Geneva. So she's a, uh, she's, she's, she's a physics geek, I would say, and a mathematics uh, person as well. And in her particular interests include cosmology and uh, particles, you know, especially in the universe. Uh, she's had a you know, prestigious career with a lot of fellowships uh, from various uh, organizations. And uh, a particular uh, achievement that she has had because of her work, uh, I would I'd like to tell you is that she has the honor of having a minor planet in the solar system named after her. So you're particularly meeting a very special person today. And she has prepared for us a talk about the early universe. And she's going to introduce to us this uh, concept of how to how we find the secrets of the early universe. So let's welcome on stage Dr. Hansa Padmanabhan. Thank you so much uh, Samir for the very kind uh, invitation and the introduction. It's really a pleasure to be back at Ayuka and a pleasure to give this uh, public lecture on a topic which is very close to my research. It's actually a, a lot the subject of my research but in a way which is uh, kind of telling you how we can, as you can see the name suggests, look at the universe's really early history. So we know the universe is 13.8 billion years old today. And we want to look at its first billion years, which is a particularly exciting time. And sometimes people call it also the final frontier of our cosmology, which is the study of the universe, because it is really the time when the first stars and galaxies are supposed to have formed. And that is something which is coming in, we'll see how this works, coming into our telescopes, into our observations due to their tremendous sensitivity and power right now. Also, I will tell you why this particular thing is written as invisible is because we are looking at a time when there wasn't much visible light. So things which we are going to be studying and looking at are not visible to the eyes, but they show up in what is known as radio frequencies, the things which you have in your radios. And that is why it's going to reveal a lot of secrets when we look at this invisible part of what is known as the light spectrum and uh, what all we can gain from that. 
So let me just set the stage by introducing something which you might already be familiar with. What is the kind of landscape which we are kind of looking at? What are the sizes? What are the distances which are um, in, involved in this problem? And in the structure of the universe, you can consider it something like a hierarchy when you, when you look at it. We are all unfortunately familiar a lot with viruses these days. And this part of the kind, uh, length scales, so to speak, is what is known as microphysics. So I am showing you from lower to higher lengths, which are from small size to uh, the very, very big sizes. Uh, you probably, those of you who understand scientific notation would just mean that this something like minus eight written in front of the 10 is just that one divided by one followed by eight zeros. And something like 10 to the 12 is one followed by 12 zeros. So think it's just like that. It's really, really huge in normal units like meters, which we are familiar with. So we are going from very small things to very big things. And some of the examples are also written over here. So this part of the realm of things is usually in the in what is called as quantum mechanics or quantum physics. So we deal with really, really small scales. We deal with small things like protons and so on. But what we are going to study and what we are going to look at is on the absolute opposite side of the uh, distances and sizes. And we should keep in mind that these are the kind of numbers we are working with. So one followed by 16 zeros of a meter. So you have, um, that is what is written as 10 to the 16. One followed by 16 zeros meters is something like what light travels in one year also known as one light year, which might be familiar to many people. It's a unit of distance. And we will also use a lot what is called as a parsec or kiloparsec or megaparsec is roughly equal to some a similar thing like a light year. And what we should also keep in mind is that the kind of numbers we are dealing like galaxies are going to be about something like one followed by 22 zeros meters. So we are really talking about very big sizes here, very big distances. And this is like setting the scale. I'm now going to show you this in a movie which is credited to uh, the American Museum of National History. And this movie just kind of zooms out the universe and enables us to see things happening at the grander and grander scales. So the first thing here is that you have the, um, the you have Himalayas. You're seeing this happening outside. We are going, uh, uh, you know, kind of from the Earth out, and we are seeing the landscape of the stars. We are seeing all of the background over here. You might recognize sometimes some of the stars which start appearing in the background. We are going to watch as we see a little bit outside the Earth and into the solar system. Again, you can recognize some stars probably. You can see Orion here, for instance. You can see a lot of these, uh, these things. And you can also see that uh, we have so much of kind of a little bit of space trash, even some artificial satellites. There are a huge number of them. And uh, of course, the useful satellites also which are there. And they are actually surrounding the Earth, making a kind of halo around the whole Earth. And now we are going to zoom out even more and you can actually see that as you can, uh, can should keep an eye on the distances which are written here. As we keep going on and on, we are now seeing a little bit the sun in the background and we are going further. And now you will also see that other things start coming and now you can see the light travel time is one second. So it's one light second away from us that you'll see all of these things. And you'll see the reaches of the solar system coming into the picture. You can see these planets. We are all familiar with the several planets, Mercury, Venus, and all of those. And here you can also see that the light travel time is increasing. We are going ahead one day, one day from the, the light is taking. And then you can see various of the constellations in the sky. Again, you might recognize some of them. And you can see actually the sun is now you're almost stopping around one year and the sun is actually a very, very a normal run of the mill ordinary star actually compared to other stars. And this is where we've paused. And you see that this is the kind of you can think as a Google map. These are the kind of neighbors of ours, something like 
you can see some of these things you may have uh, you may recognize proxima alpha centauri this is like the nearest one and the google map scale is somewhere around 10 light years so one light year is the distance light travels in a year and this one is about 10 light years and here is what is called galactic center so we are going to zoom out and see actually this galactic center we are going to see it the way we uh, as we follow that arrow it will come into the picture you have 70 years that's very important we our largest radio signals actually come up to there so that is like the 70 light years kind of and this is our galaxy obviously it's not a true picture it is just something which we are living inside and here is somewhere this is the amount of distance which we have covered now 100,000 years the light would have taken to come up to here and now you can see another nice uh, picture of it of course not a photograph but this is you can see this galaxy of ours milky way is a very beautiful spiral galaxy it has all of these arms it also has a number of things which are in between the arms and you have some things which are clusters of stars and various other things which are part of this galaxy again on the google map you can see that the scale which is there is about 10,000 or 10 kilo so kilo is like thousand so 10 kilo light years that is the kind of number and that roughly that is like the size of a galaxy and our galaxy is a typical one and now we go ahead and we see that we are now crossing the galaxy and now this is about a million light years this is the typical distance between galaxies so these are the kind of numbers which we should be used to when we're thinking about cosmology this is our nearest neighbor it is indeed somewhere around that much distance from us about a million light years away from us and that is called andromeda and this is actually a proper photograph because it is outside and then we go ahead we look at all of these galaxies which are um, nearby the milky way and we have actually uh, now been able to have big surveys which map the galaxies around us each of these points now is one galaxy you should see this really that we have mapped so many galaxies with our surveys we'll come a little bit into how that actually works and these are we also have some very exotic objects which are called as active galactic nuclei or quasars these are also bright objects which we have mapped these are the furthest we can see except for something called the cosmic microwave background this is the light coming from the earliest parts of the universe uh, just after the big bang and this is actually somewhere we can call it as our cosmic horizon really that is really the light which is coming from the earliest time and it forms like a horizon both in space and time so now with all of these galaxies this particular slide comes becomes very relevant the discovery which was made somewhere in the 20th century by hubble and various others actually is that when you look at these galaxies the the way they are moving their speeds get higher and higher as their distance from us gets low, higher and higher so essentially if you plot the speed and distance you see a line like this and that is something which was used to show that in some in in not in a sense of some, uh, something expanding into something the universe as a whole is expanding space and time in the space actually is increasing in some sense you can see almost all galaxies are flying away from us this is a sentence which is true only at the largest scales for instance the andromeda and us are actually coming together but on a very large cosmological sense things are becoming space itself is expanding as time progresses so that is one way to put this and how do we actually know that or how do we measure that this is comes back to something you've seen in the lab if you have some kind of hydrogen lamp then what we know is that these all these things have something called a spectrum so spectrum is something like a signature of a particular element and hydrogen always has certain signatures which are certain lines in a, in uh, in the in light so for example it the wavelength of it is like its color for example and hydrogen will have a certain pattern and you can see this kind of thing in the lab however if you look at uh, something which is further away like for example something in our neighborhood or in nebula or so and we see the same sort of pattern then we know that hydrogen is present in that that thing in that orion nebula and when you look at a galaxy which is somewhere a little further 
we see the same kind of hydrogen but then we see it kind of moved so its color actually becomes a little red so it is called as a red shift and red shift actually is also a measure of how far away something is because it is something like your doppler effect not exactly doppler effect but something like that that essentially as things are moving are, are further and further away they are moving actually faster and faster also away so therefore your wavelength actually gets stretched so this hydrogen line appears at a redder side and further away the galaxy is you'll see more shift to the red so that is actually an evidence that as things are going further away they are actually moving faster and this is why the galaxies recede away more and more and you will find that this is actually the evidence for the expanding universe so this is something we see and another thing that we are very lucky which some of you may have uh, known about is that yes we can see the past now how does that work when i look at any of you i'm not looking at you as you are just now i'm looking at you as you were a very very tiny fraction of a second ago because light takes some time to come between you to me so we saw that for example solar system and all one second or one hour the light is taking However, in normal day to day life, we don't, it doesn't matter at all because the light is so fast and the distances are very small. But in cosmology, it starts to matter that if you have a telescope and you're able to see further and further away, then you're actually seeing the object as it was more and more in the past. So actually you're seeing older and older objects as your sensitivity improves of course you can't see the same object as it was in the past that would uh, violate a lot of things like causality and so on but you can see a snapshots of the universe as they were a long time ago when you look at them very far back in space so that is really the whole crux of the story if you look further and further away in the universe which we today can do with james webb space telescope which you must have heard of and various other things you can actually see the past in some sense in that sense we are very lucky as archaeologists so therefore if you kind of look at the universe and you ask what are the milestones in its evolution according to our standard laws of physics you have for example what we call as big bang that is just a, a name actually to quantify the ignorance that we have in this very first early time where as i said this quantum mechanics and gravity have to come together to form a consistent picture and then at some point you had the first atoms and this is the point we will focus on where things came together under the influence of gravity and the first stars lit up our universe it is known as cosmic dawn sometimes it is known as a cosmic renaissance because before that there was no light and suddenly there was light and so the end of something called dark ages and then we had various things and as you can see that today is actually humans are very very close to the end of the day and uh, it, uh, finally the sun will become a red giant but that's only like 8 a.m tomorrow so that's essentially what has happened in if they put the entire universe in one day and now when we think about the universe we want to think about what is there in that in the universe probably many of you know that the a lot of the universe is actually dark in nature so people are not sure exactly what are these dark components there is something called dark matter which we have not seen in the lab but we have evidence for it in the astrophysical scenarios there is something else which is making up a majority of the universe which behaves like a fluid having negative pressure and that kind of satisfies most of the observations and for uh, a name of it you can call it as a dark energy or some kind of cosmological constant that's what they would say but uh, it nevertheless remains that we do not actually know what 96% of the universe is made up 95% only 5% are the ordinary matter and we will also call it as baryon so baryons and atoms what we see atoms molecules etc are one and the same this is just a technical term and only 5% is made of this baryon but what is more interesting is when you try to do a budget of the baryon itself so what is this baryons made up of most of the time overwhelmingly the they are made of gas 
So they are made of all this, you can ignore the technical terms, but all of this is gas or plasma or ionized material. The kind of things which we think of as atoms, like which are there in our day-to-day -day life, are mostly confined to the stars and stellar systems. Those are less than 10% of this 5%. So if this picture humbled you, this picture is even more humbling because it tells us that the stars actually are even less than 10% of our entire baryons. So all the atoms in the universe, we understand the physics, which we don't understand for these two things. So we need to know from, you know, what they are made up of so that we can try to use it to understand the other two components. So here is where we want, we know that actually, if you count all the, the atoms in the universe, overwhelmingly they are hydrogen. So hydrogen is not so common here, but it is extremely common in the universe as a whole. And hydrogen actually did some very interesting things as the universe evolved. So as I said, we can also see the past, we can see this evolution in a sense, and we are going to look at mostly hydrogen. So when we think about physics with the universe, which the part we understand, we should just be thinking hydrogen. 92% of it is hydrogen, some part is helium, and the rest is other trace elements. So hydrogen actually went through some interesting transitions from neutral to ionized and that is something which we call as reionization. So I'm just going to now show you here a little movie of how we think or how we have simulated hydrogen to evolve. So here is actually a galaxy or a star system, a very luminous galaxy. And this galaxy actually emits a large number of photons and whatever hydrogen was originally neutral in that environment can become ionized. So that means hydrogen has a proton electron that is neutral. However, if you hit it with ultraviolet light, like for instance, which is emitted by that star, you will get it to break the proton and electron. And this is the ionized hydrogen, which is essentially a proton electron. It so happened that around about 1 billion years after the Big Bang, by that time, most of the stars had ionized bubbles around them. So they had, for instance, the galaxies had made a lot of bubbles of ionized gas, just as we saw in that movie. And this plasma was able to overlap. So now you can see these both movies together, that here is one object which ionized the gas around it. So originally, which was all neutral, and as many, many, many of these objects were appearing in the universe, like because star formation happened and there was structure and so on, all of these regions came together, they overlapped, and that is called as cosmic reionization. It was a milestone event in the history of the universe where all of this hydrogen was transformed from neutral form to protons and electrons, which is the ionized form. So this is actually known as cosmic reionization. You probably have heard about it in the previous Chandra lectures also from a different point of view. So this epoch of reionization is somewhere the final frontier because it happened and we believe that it completed when the universe was around about a billion years, uh, when the universe was about around a, a billion years old. So that is what we can look at. And now how we can see it essentially. So how can we see this happen? And that is something where we can use about something called quasars, which is like the distant bright sources in our universe. So these quasars are actually objects which form when there are nuclei of galaxies which become what is known as active. And these are special objects. You may have heard about it in different contexts. These, these are thought that there are black holes in the center of these objects and so on. But nevertheless, we can see these kind of quasars. And when light from the quasar comes to us, we can see how the light is being affected by hydrogen which is there in between. So for example, uh, you may have known that there is something called an absorption spectrum. So spectrum just means a signature of an element. If you have elements in between you and something bright, like a torch, think of this as just a torch. This torch really was emitting some light and there was some absorption because of the hydrogen in between. And that is coming to us, which is called process spectrum. And actually what people have found, which we won't spend too much time, but this is one of the frontiers also, that when you see these quasars and you see all of this light, we can see evidence when the universe came from 
neutral to ionized and that is how we know that reionization was actually completed. But there is just one thing about using individual things like using galaxies or having to observe galaxies. So with for instance all our Hubble Space Telescope and all of these different instruments, we have been able to look at galaxies during the first billion years. So this is basically what the galaxies, this is, you can ignore what is the technical terms on this slide. This is just the numbers of galaxies as a function of their brightness. So think of this as just something like a brightness of a galaxy. And this thing is actually the numbers, how many of them are there. This is faint, this is bright. So there are so many galaxies we already know between faint and bright uh, ends of the, uh, in numbers. However, what is very important is this is really the tip of the iceberg. So even with a telescope like James Webb Space Telescope, you won't be seeing a large number of faint galaxies. And people believe that these faint galaxies were the biggest players in this process of reionization to make hydrogen go from the uh, neutral form to ionized form. And this could be totally hidden to norm, normal telescopes surveys, even with very, very, very important, very sensitive telescopes. So how do we understand this reionization with the help of anything else? So for this, we need to think about the hydrogen. So hydrogen again comes to somewhere our rescue. And it comes to the rescue because neutral hydrogen, if hydrogen is neutral, it has something called a 21 centimeter line radiation. So this may be slightly technical, but just to understand in a very simple way, the hydrogen has a proton and an electron, and there is one quantum state, one state of that, of that system in which there's what is called a spin is aligned and another state where it is opposite. So this is called, these are just two states, think of it as two states and where, when there is a jump between one state and another state, you will, uh, you can also show that this atom will emit light of a wavelength which is 21 centimeter and its frequency is somewhere around 1420 megahertz. Now this is something which comes in the what is known as radio frequency. So these are numbers which you'll be familiar with when you have radios, for example, tuning. So these are not things which you can see with your eyes. So they are not part of the visible light, but this is definitely what is used in understanding hydrogen from our own galaxy in a very big way. So our galaxy is having a lot of neutral hydrogen. This is actually a map of our galaxy done in uh, neutral hydrogen. And you can see that more dense regions have more hydrogen like this and more uh, fainter ones don't have, just a color map. And this is happening because we can map this 21 centimeter line of hydrogen in our galaxy. In fact, we can do better. We can go and look at this 21 centimeter line from the early universe. And that is something which introduces a technique which is very new, which has just been is being developed called intensity mapping. So you have a galaxy and this galaxy has hydrogen gas and this hydrogen gas is emitting this 21 centimeter. And we will see that this wavelength at which it is emitting is getting red shifted. We saw that it goes to the red side because of the expansion of the universe. This galaxy is very far away. This, 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 uh, all this light is coming to our telescope very red. So we know that we can make a map of where that galaxy is sitting because we have this 21 centimeter from that galaxy. And we will know that it is coming from a certain point in the universe just because how much stretched it is tells you where it is. Now we can do the same thing for another part of the universe which is closer to us. Again, we get a similar kind of map but in a different color, so to speak, because essentially what is happening is you have the same 21 centimeter, but it is shifted by different amounts depending on where it is. So this is known as intensity mapping. You want to take your telescope to make certain maps of the 21 centimeter of the hydrogen at different points in our universe and thereby you can understand how it has been evolving. So you are understanding how hydrogen evolves in this 21 centimeter. 
and that is extremely important for several reasons. So the first reason is that I told you that we have galaxies in our universe and we have mapped certain regions. If we saw in that original American Museum of History movie, we've mapped a certain part of the universe and directly in galaxies, but that's an extremely small part. When we think of the whole universe, when we think of cosmic dawn and all of these things, dark ages and reionization, we haven't seen any of this in the galaxy. Galaxy is here. There is this cosmic microwave background, which people have, of course, looked at in detail, but that is only one single surface at a very large uh, distance from us. But in between, we would love to fill this gap. And that is something this intensity mapping is promising to do because really you have map, 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 map of this hydrogen, which is filling the space between our galaxies and our edge of the universe. So this is really the whole uh, power which it can bring this uh, new technique. And also it can help us to understand reionization because it is really in mapping that particular element, which is hydrogen, which is doing this process and is uh, taking part in the transition between this dark ages and our current universe. There's also other advantages. So for example, this is definitely not something you can see with your eye, you're seeing it in radio, but you can see that if you have galaxies, again, this is another way of showing that the galaxy survey is here, but the cosmic microwave background is here, everything in between. In principle, you can get it from 21 centimeter. And you can also write down, this is a little more technical, but just to understand that if you have so many maps, you will have a lot of information. Now, information is counted in something called modes and there's a mathematical way to define that and so on. But just to understand that whatever information we have from here and from the galaxy at present, you can have 10,000 times more than that because of this uncharted area. So that is also very powerful and that is good for doing cosmology or understanding fundamental physics because this is really the biggest data set we are ever going to have. And also it can tell us how those bubbles, which we saw that all those stars, they formed bubbles, galaxy formed bubbles. And in between the bubbles, there was some neutral hydrogen and that you can actually see it in action. So it's something like slicing Swiss cheese. That is how people can say. And it is just telling you something called tomography. So those of you who are familiar with the medical field may know something called PET scan. It's called positron emission tomography. And that tomography there just stands for three-dimensional picture. So that's what we want to do. We want to make a three-dimensional picture of our universe. And that is something that we can do with the help of this 21 centimeter. There is also some pieces of work, some of which, which I and collaborators have been involved in to understand how this hydrogen is actually distributed. So today we have a large number of already existing data, which is telling us about the distribution of hydrogen. And what it suggests is that we can actually build up a consistent picture of the hydrogen, how it evolved in the universe for the last several um, billion years and try to predict what telescopes are going to see. So radio telescopes are the ones which are going to be doing all this intensity mapping. And we can predict what kind of, um, um, what kind of things that they will see and how much of signal they will see and so on with a certain model. And that is, of course, very, very exciting, but it is also challenging. For a telescope to be able to see this hydrogen from cosmic dawn and reionization, which I told you, it has to overcome a lot of barriers. All of these other things which are extra sources of uh, emission are going to stay on top of this very elusive signal. So you want to get hydrogen and you want to understand it, but then there will be other sources like our own galaxy emits very strongly and all other things which are called as foreground. So these are things you don't want, which are there in your map. And you can show that those things are about 10,000 to 100,000 times brighter than the signal. So this is really the needle in the haystack. So we really need to understand how to isolate this from the rest. And when you do, and, and several, several experiments are doing that. So we have our uh, GMRT, of course, a radio telescope, which is nearby here. And various others like LOFAR is there in the Netherlands. There are some in South Africa, several others. And one of the biggest efforts in order to do many of these things, the hydrogen and so on, is called Square Kilometer Array. 
as the name suggests the square kilometer array has spent some time on it because india has just got involved in this project and this is a radio telescope array it's an international venture as the name suggests it's going to have one square kilometer of these radio telescopes positioned in south um, africa and in australia and it should be operational by about the end of the decade actually and this is really something which will go deep into this epoch which we saw like as you go back in space you go back in time and we will be looking at these first galaxies in their radio emission in their 21 centimeter with the square kilometer array some fun facts are there about the square kilometer array which you can go through their website it's quite interesting the sk telescope is uh, something which will have unprecedented data in an unprecedented also the kinds of speeds and so on you can check out that a single day's data would probably take 2 million years to play back on an ipod that's a crazy amount of data and just a few years ago i learned this word exabyte now just like petabyte and so on this is called an exabyte is a unit of information and just to give some context 5 exabyte is every word ever spoken by every human being on this earth right from the beginning and this telescope will have 11 exabytes on it through every single day so it's really really a big venture and also there will be more data in this telescope than the entire network okay that was in 2020 but i'm sure it's true for 2024 as well and this is really a place where you can see how big it is and what kind of uh, 126 tennis courts i mean so this is a really big venture and it is happening it's an international collaboration in Canada, Switzerland, India, many countries are part of this collaboration now and they are working towards the square kilometer array. And even before that, many people have started doing projects which are on a smaller scale to understand this hydrogen through the radio uh, lines through the 21 cm. And the first claimed one was actually in 2018 where they believed that they'd seen a signal of this hydrogen which happened at now when you think of this word redshift it will keep coming up redshift is just a measure of time and something like 17 16 here is about a few hundred million years after the big bang so really the epoch of the first stars and so on and that is where they thought they had seen the signal it was set up in a desert but colleagues from india and others included they were also able to set up this experiment a similar one on a lake so it's a completely different set up and they were unable to see actually the same signal which was found by the other experiment so maybe there was an explanation that this could be due to the this could be something to do with the instrument and the just but nevertheless it 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 uh, the, it is absolutely true this field is very very active so various people are trying to set up experiments and these are really um, the first few in the field which are trying to observe the first stars the cosmic dawn through this hydrogen So if you want to actually avoid the big problem which is facing the experiments of today this 21 cm if you can think about trying to combine different experiments so this is really something which is very um, very new so i will try to tell you what it um, what it actually has to do with we don't have to worry about the technical details but what synergy or cross correlation means is that you have a telescope which is a radio telescope this is called meerkat you can have another any other telescope and if you have another telescope which is an optical or visible light uh, telescope you have heard so, so many examples of uh, optical telescopes you can cross match the signal between the two so what it means in a simple way is to just take a product and make an average So in a very simple way what happens you can show that if you did not do a cross match if you just if you just had the signal by itself then you will have something called noise and foreground and other things which you don't want but if you take one telescope and another telescope and try to combine it in a very interesting way called cross correlation you can show that most of the time you will not have these noise because what it means is they just average out it's something like you know a sine function averaging out to zero because the terms just are not Con they are not matching each other right so that is exactly what happens here that you have two different kinds of things and you want to just get out your signal so that is something people already have tried 
and what is now very promising by now i mean last five years <laughs> is that you can do this with non-hydrogen so it is not just hydrogen that you use something called comap is called a carbon monoxide mapping array project we and several others are involved in it so carbon monoxide is a very good tracer of star formation again you don't have to worry about what is on the slide but just to note that we actually have the first intensity mapping of carbon monoxide which is which is still to come for hydrogen actually so carbon monoxide was much easier to do and that's something which we improved a lot upon the neck uh, on the previous measurement and those of you who might be interested can go and look at something called a focus issue in uh, in a in journal called astrophysical journal is just about the news of the carbon monoxide intensity mapping and that is really a bit of milestone because carbon monoxide which is so bad here on earth actually is good for star formation in space because what it is uh, what it has some people uh, you may have thought uh, you know studied this a little bit that the carbon monoxide is a molecule which has energy states so for example you have different levels of energy of this molecule and it can emit at different frequencies so for example you can have a frequency the lowest emission of it is somewhere at 115 gigahertz so this is like your microwave oven this is microwave uh, emission lines actually and the next one is twice of this that is 230 and the next one is again thrice like that now why is that interesting interesting because this comap experiment which we have it has a band where it is sensitive so you have a certain frequency band and that frequency is like 30 gigahertz again some microwave frequencies and this 30 gigahertz you can show that because of this red shift so if you have for example a frequency which is 115 which is the rest frame then at around about redshift of 2 to 3 which means when roughly when the universe was about one third of its present size that is way back in the past 3 billion years actually this is what you are going to be sensitive to you're going to be sensitive to carbon monoxide at that time however and this is this is the only slide which is slightly technical but it's a little bit important to understand how this all works that you have also this particular band which has emission coming from a much earlier time in the universe so redshift 7 here means when the universe was about one eighth of its present size so at that time if you consider this number you can actually show that the radiation from here has got stretched so much that it is also coming inside the same band so what now we will do with comap is that we make another band which is one half of this band so that is called as a ku band and in this band you will actually be able to get the lowest transition which is this 115 transition from a redshift of seven it's just simple algebra actually so one plus z one plus z and twice and so on just cancels so that means that you can actually cross match these bands if you cross match these bands you won't see anything from here but you'll see the common part which is the signal coming from that very early time okay so that is really why because of this nice ladder there is opportunities like this to map very early universe with carbon monoxide and very recently we also have something very interesting coming up with the james webb so the james webb space telescope i think everybody is aware that it is producing so many images so many pictures of beautiful galaxies at very early times it's it's now found something very interesting that is also a potential you know something you can combine with our studies of reionization that we think that the luminosity the brightness of these galaxies which are being found by the James Webb telescope are not matching theoretical expectations by a lot so for example just to tell you that without any details these are the kind of model predictions and these are the observations so you can just see that there's a big gap between many of the model and the prediction and these it just the main thing you have to take away is that the these galaxies are very big they are very massive and they are very bright they are not really matching the way we understand them and it could be this is one of the uh, some several explanations that there could be something to do with our understanding of cosmology
So there is already something which is being uh, put constraints with this James Webb. So here I'm just going to show you in a simple way what the web result is. This is something like the brightness of the galaxies, some average brightness as a function of, again, redshift, which is the cosmological time. So, for example, this is where about a few hundred million years after the Big Bang till almost a billion years after the Big Bang. So in this period, you see this big rise in the luminosity or in the brightness of the galaxy. Any model you take will predict much, much lower, except for some models, almost all the models predict that you can't have it so high, it should be you know, much smoother, it should be much flatter, this curve. What we found is that if you don't uh, you know, look at the astrophysics, but just look at the underlying base cosmology, this all this dark matter, dark energy, and so on, which produces something called a power spectrum, if you modify it a little bit, then you get what you need. So this, if you modify it, it goes back to being kind of flat. And that is quite interesting because this is kind of hinting to us that already, already the galaxies which are seen by the James Webb, that's the only takeaway from here, might be challenging our cosmological model. And this can be further probed by doing an intensity mapping actually, which I don't have too much time for, but just to tell you that intensity mapping can help over here. So that's it. If we want to put together our understanding now of where we are and how we have been able to understand a large amount of the space in cosmology, we can check out this particular timeline, which is like between, uh, now you see this is million years, thousand million is a billion. So we are going from about one billion years all the way back. And this is an equivalent scale, which is redshift. And redshift is just like, as I said, a marker for time. So time keeps on going lower, the redshift keeps going higher. That is just telling you because the light is getting stretched and stretched from this early time more. So that is, uh, and just some important f features is that reionization is ending somewhere here. The dark ages, which is no stars or galaxies is somewhere behind here. And this probe, which is the hydrogen, is always there, it's ubiquitous, and hopefully we will have square kilometer array, which will tell us about how it evolved. But even before that, we have other things. We have this carbon monoxide, which is very interesting. It is becoming more interesting because it is easier to observe, and you can do what is called intensity mapping with this carbon monoxide. You can use the fact that there is a ladder of the states of carbon monoxide to probe even early times with this molecule, which was very, very interesting and it has not been done with hydrogen so far. There are two other or many other, these are two say, uh, important ones, uh, important uh, elements like actually these are ionized carbon, ionized oxygen. People are building some balloons and other kind of telescope in order to actually make maps of that also. And that will, act, uh, will probe the epochs which are somewhere around a few hundred million years even after the Big Bang. So that will be other wavelengths to do that. One can show also that you can do uh, intensity mapping of what is called as a Lyman alpha line. So hydrogen has another transition, maybe many of you have heard of it. It is called the Lyman series and you can intensity map that and find out something which will be able to connect to your James Webb results. One thing which I did not have that much time to talk about, but maybe many of you have heard, is that there is a multi-messenger prospect over here, that there are gravitational waves. And we have been able to sort of find that the gravitational wave from certain very massive black holes emits in the nanohertz frequency. So that is something called pulsar timing. Again, some of you might be familiar, but just to show you that this is where it comes into the picture. And so we have pretty much tiled our you know, cosmological landscape with all of these different experiments. And now the whole point me is to combine them properly. And I will end by just telling you about a few questions we can potentially answer with all this new data. First is, I told you that there is this Big Bang, which we still don't understand. It's just the beginning of the universe as we know it, and uh, uh, beginning of everything, space and time. 
but we do understand everything from a very 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 tiny fraction of a second onwards and the very first epoch after the big bang is known as cosmic inflation so that is something again people may have heard this is something which comes up in cosmology there are models how did the universe behave in the very first few fractions of a second it it can be shown that a certain number a certain parameter one is called fnl essentially there is one of uh, several parameters has to have a certain value for the universe to behave the way it behaves today and this parameter is going to show up in the hydrogen map so for example if this parameter was very strange we will see a hydrogen map or intensity map which is very different from what we expect so this is actually something much stronger and we found that it can do um, real things to our map which we can find finally come back and see what what happened at just after the big bang the other thing is if you take a look at all these very beautiful pictures these are false color images of dark matter so of course you can't see dark matter but there is something called gravitational lensing which again you may have heard of which allows you to probe roughly how this dark matter is distributed or where it is roughly and that's what's shown in blue and gas is shown like this but we still don't know what it's made of so we don't know what dark matter is made of and different people have different uh, you know models for it and again some kinds of models of dark matter will show up as signatures in the hydrogen because the hydrogen is on top of the dark matter so dark matter is a lot of it and hydrogen is just some part like one sixth or something and so where the dark matter goes the hydrogen usually follows that so if the dark matter is of a certain form then the hydrogen's map will look a certain way so that is really how we can probe really what is dark matter from this from this intensity mapping and that's also something which comes to the end that this is slide credited to andre messenger the main goal now in the next decade after 2030 is to map 50% of the observed universe and in his words that's probably worthy of a nobel prize so this is really the big aim of all of these different intensity mapping experiments to probe everything that we can probe and try to answer fundamental questions so that's it let me conclude by telling you that we are now able to observe the furthest and the earliest galaxies in our universe and that is due to the fact that we are lucky we can see back in space and that's back in time and these early epochs right before the first stars formed are actually invisible because they don't have stars and there is only a huge amount of neutral hydrogen in these times and that is what we can actually get in radio telescopes because the hydrogen does not have this visible light but you can see it in radio because it has this 21 cm a very important one is the square kilometer array which is an international collaboration and it is a large number of countries are part of it and we will be they will be constructing essentially these big telescopes and will probe a lot of this volume of the universe which is between our today's survey and the cosmic microwave background and the main aim is to understand how hydrogen was distributed and how it evolved especially with this 21 cm but that's not all you can do other lines other particular molecules are there which are going to help with this effort because they are going to be there along with the hydrogen and we can see how they are um, you know showing us new insights about this hydrogen how it evolved there's a multi messenger prospect also because the gravitational waves from very very heavy black holes such as the one at the center of our galaxy which you may have seen photos of of course and the neighboring galaxy they if they merge then they produce gravitational waves and that gives us another insight into this whole reionization process and the final aim of course is to probe the biggest questions in cosmology nature of dark matter and for instance the inflation the big bang etc with these invisible epochs of the universe so that's it i'll stop here thanks a lot i'll take any questions Thanks, Ansa. Uh, we are open to questions. Uh, if you have any queries, please raise your hands. We will come to you with a microphone. Uh, those online may also put their questions.
questions on the chat and I'm going to try to read them from here. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for a wonderful uh, explanation and simplistic way of explaining. I did not understand that part when you moved from carbon hydrogen to carbon monoxide, okay. CO. Mm -hmm. So why did you uh, need, felt the need of explaining CO lines uh, basically? Okay. So, uh, that shift from hydrogen 20, 21 centimeter to shift from carbon monoxide, why was that study needed in first place itself? Okay, so th this is because in hydrogen, there is a problem on the ground to study this 21 centimeter, even though it's the biggest thing, there is a lot of mess, so to speak, something called foreground. Basically, things which are emitted by our own galaxy are sitting in the same band. So people have been trying for 12 years to remove that and to get in and to try to find the signal. But this signal is 100,000 times smaller than this foreground in 21 centimeter. So we have to try other things. I mean, of course, you want to try to isolate because these things, I mean, there are technical reasons how you can get these things out. They have different emissions, they have different spectra compared to the hydrogen. You can use certain things. But one thing which is becoming important is other lights. This is in order to avoid this foreground that is becoming important with what is called as other uh, cross correlation. So cross correlation really the thing here which I showed you all of this is foreground, systematic foreground. In a cross correlation you don't have it. So that's why people are trying to do other lines so that they can cross correlate and which we have found actually is even very powerful and isolate the signal. That's why carbon and carbon monoxide is one of the very favorite lines. Firstly, because of this ladder and so on. Secondly, because the instrument here is extremely well studied. Like if you go to this microwave frequency, people have been doing it for several years when they were studying cosmic microwave background. So the, all the technology is there with us, which is not there in the case of 21 centimeter. So that's why that has become very interesting. So, uh, what is the level of deeper understanding of hydrogen up till now, so that we can enhance it to make uh, mini fusions or about the recent concept of sun in the box, which is going on. I mean, mini fusions, which we are trying to implement, uh, some startups are trying to implement mm -hmm. mini fusions. Uh, uh, ah, okay, no, no, no. This hydrogen is very different from that hydrogen. So hydrogen in the earth is actually something which people are going to do, you know, for example, renewable energies and so on. I'm talking about hydrogen on a very different scale. This is hydrogen, which is there several, several, several thousand light years from us, several hundred thousand light years from us. We can't use it here. But what that, that hydrogen is actually an understanding understanding of the dark matter and of cosmology because that hydrogen has nothing to do with planets or stars or anything like this. It is just there in the universe and there is a huge amount and we are trying to understand it so that we can understand cosmology. So does that understanding of that hydrogen help hmm. us to build here mini fusions? I don't think so. I think they are very different, uh, very different subjects. So you can't really, maybe, I don't think there's any connection actually because it's, uh, it's a cosmology, yeah. Is another question there. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. I had a similar question regarding uh, carbon uh, monoxide mm -hmm. uh, uh, IM. So, uh, actually, uh, the carbon monoxide is not that much abundant as hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So, will it affect the observations? In yeah. any way? It's a great question. Carbon monoxide is not as abundant, but there is enough of it especially at this particular redshift. So if you go back and you look, actually it's about 2 billion years. In two, I mean redshift of 2 and redshift of uh, 3 like this. If you see the universe, at this point, the universe was making stars in a frenzy. Actually, the star formation rate was very, very, very high. And carbon monoxide always shows up when the star formation rate is high. So even though carbon monoxide is in general not abundant, we hope that it is extremely abundant here and that's why we detected this for example and so on. 
and we also hope that it is there whenever stars are there. So stars formed, we think that the first galaxies formed around about redshift 15, which is like few hundred million years. And we are only thinking of things after that. So after that, there has to be a lot of carbon monoxide. And the reason is it's so easy to get that whatever is there will help us to get at the hydrogen. And that's the spirit. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Sure. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, my doubt is in one of the earlier slides where uh, you have shown the video about cosmic horizon. So yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. That yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. So I think it's the one with the um, with the uh, yeah uh, that one yeah mm -hmm. the after that yeah after that. That's so right. uh, oh here mm -hmm. uh, okay yeah, I'll look at that. I'll have I asked my doubt mathematically. The uh, it shows like more <laughs> similar to mod X. Uh, we can't see the light is only spread out in the uh, conical regions. Why is it not? No, no, the no. That is no, no, no. The conical is only the places where we have mapped galaxies. So okay. there are empty regions in between which still have not mapped with our current surveys. So this is just showing you, for example, every telescope or every survey you may have seen has something called a footprint. Footprint means what part of the sky it is focused, you know, it's beam. So those are exactly just those. So oh, thanks. The rest of it we have not yet mapped. Every single point on this is a galaxy and that there are so many which we have mapped. This is just to show you that. So any specific reasons why they why they have not been No, mapped? just selection effects. You know, for example, the survey may have certain reasons to choose a certain clean patch of the sky. Again, this fore foreground kind of thing comes up in all the electromagnetic spectrum. You may choose certain part of the uh, thing strategically where you have more chance to detect fainter galaxies. That is really why these surveys work like that. Each Thank one you. has its uh, different. Yeah. Uh, like I have been hearing that cosmologists are known for approximating things. So, uh, so what if this dark matter is really some uh, approximation we missed out like before? Okay. So is it possible? So first of all, cosmologists today cannot get away with approximating anything because cosmology has become what is called a precision science. So precision science is something where you have things measured. The observations are telling you things to one part in a thousand, accurate to one part in a thousand. And you cannot get away with any error which is, you know, somewhere uh, beyond that. So we have to do, and uh, not only that, there are so many different types of observations that you it, cosmology cannot is not approximate anymore. You may have heard of something called Hubble tension. Hubble tension meaning that the Hubble constant is inaccurate, even if it is inaccurate to one or two kilometer per second per megaparsec, you are going to have a, what is called as five sigma tension, which is a big uncertainty. So things are accurate to very, very, very fine precision. So definitely that's one thing which we cannot do anymore, which we could, uh, if people were doing that in the past, but there was no data, but now we can. Secondly, this dark matter as it is, Whatever, you know, we have seen of it, we cannot actually see that. But whatever observations we have from different things like this co cosmic microwave background, for example, as well as galaxies, and as well as, for example, some of this, what I call gravitational lensing. Now, lensing means that you have a big amount of matter and it changes the way the light is moving. And then you see a different image than what actually existed. So with this kind of lensing, you can actually map dark matter in some sense. You can see where it is and what it's doing. All of them are pointing towards what is called as cold dark matter model, which is what uh, essentially I was showing. And something what uh, one of the very easy, uh, one of the candidates for dark matter, part of dark matter is called axion. That also some of you may have heard. And these are things which arise in the standard model of particle physics or slightly beyond the standard model of particle physics. So this essentially until it is found in the lab after 40 years of experimentation we still haven't found it. until it is found in the lab we only have all of these hints but all these hints are somewhere in general pointing in the same direction if dark matter had a completely different uh, you know form as you say you have to explain a large number of observations with that dark matter which at the moment many models are finding difficult to do 
that is how it is so you have this cold dark matter which is working fine only thing is we have not seen it and if if and when we do it will be the solution to dark matter otherwise we have to rely on the cosmology for it okay yeah <clears throat> just just a second so i'll take some questions from okay. online as yeah, well yeah uh, and yeah. there are some people about 30 people watching online okay well. sure yeah. so um, there are questions about the very early universe which is yeah. probably not you yeah. were, what you were not covering here sure and, sure uh, things like they're asking about uh, low entropy states in the really early universe and how is it possible to have or if the universe was expanding with an acceleration it was is. it bending space and time and then how are we in that case talking about time okay which, uh, is a correct as a concept so uh, okay. i think you can answer them or you can point them to some yes yeah. where they can find more answers okay now these are all very interesting questions uh, that's something which uh, of course i did not have time to cover because i am talking really after all of this happened and when the first stars formed and so on but indeed these are going to give us close to that very very early uh, early time very early universe uh, some of these uh, questions have to went which, which for instance do with low entropy state and all that has to happen when we have a full understanding of the quantum theory of gravity now why quantum theory of gravity because gravity was of operation at the early universe you had these extremely small um, small scales but you also therefore needed quantum mechanics so we do not yet have a consistent picture of the quantum theory of gravity it is possible that some theories of gravity lead to signatures which are visible in this hydrogen for it will have their imprint and in that case it would be great because with large number of intensity maps we can come back to that and yeah what was the second question was essentially also that how space and time so always think of the expanding universe as space itself expanding so that was something i didn't have too much time to cover but i'm sure people have covered it before always think of it only not that we are at the center of the universe the fact that almost all galaxies are flying away from us every galaxy will say that so essentially think of it like some kind of rubber sheet the rubber sheet is a little bit misnomer because it is rubber sheet is expanding into some space we don't have anything expanding into space space itself is expanding distances between objects are increasing not on the earth and not on a terrestrial sense and all that all that is uh, because in the earth other processes are uh, there but as only at this mega parsec so when you think of these kind of scales only when you go above here you can think of expanding universe so space between those points is expanding so you should think of it like that think of for example also another way to think about it is some kind of cake or some kind of uh, dough floor which is uh, which has raisins uh, stuck in it and this cake is rising and then all the raisins will find that they are find uh, they are further away from each other as time progresses so this is an expansion of space in time so there isn't a problem with relativity or anything yeah thanks uh so uh, let let's go to somebody who has not asked a question first yeah. and then we'll mm -hmm. get back to you thanks so ma'am uh, it was a great lecture actually uh, i had a doubt regarding how can we integrate uh the ifs integral field spectroscopy and the intensity mapping techniques to like uh further the field of study yeah so intensity mapping really is spectroscopic so in intensity mapping in some sense you have extremely good spect spectral resolution because you want to get for example in comap i told you that the you probably know that there is this ka band which is 30 gigahertz now its spectral resolution so it's each of these stars 30 megahertz so we have already r of 1000 r of 500 r of 1000 is very routine in intensity mapping and in this kind of picture the spatial resolution actually is very bad which is fine because in intensity mapping we want to map everything we don't care about the individual objects if we care about the individual objects we'll pick up only the bright ones so that is in that sense in it is indeed a spectroscopy but also you can say that things like if you consider james webb or those kind of spectroscopic instruments they will provide us the spectra of objects which will show up also in the intensity map so you can think of some kind of cross correlation between this 
individual object and the map. Indeed, that was the first time when intensity mapping was done in 2010, actually. The first time it was done, they made a map of 21 centimeter in which they used galaxies. They used the galaxy to cross correlate, to actually find the position of this 21 centimeter. So yeah, there are many ways in which you can score. You, there is a scope for having a synergy between these two things. And in intensity mapping is spectroscopic. So one uh, one more basic question from, uh, from yeah, the online uh, yeah. viewers is that uh, we're talking about the quasars. Yeah. Uh, so what is the difference between a quasar and a pulsar and a black okay. hole maybe? So yeah. So they are completely different objects. <laughs> so uh, pulsars are rapidly rotating neutron stars, and those are like small scale, small size compared to quasar. Quasar is actually as a galaxy size object, something like I don't have a picture. I, one of these objects is a quasar. I don't know which one, but you can look it up. So one, they are actually galaxy size uh, objects which are there in the universe, and these are uh, very very bright, and their brightness is as big as an entire galaxy but they are also very compact. So quasars are nothing to do with neutron stars. These are, ho these, are, these are believed to be the active black holes. So black holes which are accreting material and it allows them to shine in different wavelengths. They are extremely unique the way they are, uh, you know, the way different spectra of it and that's why we can identify. Pulsars are completely different. They have, rapid, they have a very, very, very repeating pattern of light which comes because they are spinning. So. Let's go for one last question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as per the spectral analysis you discuss, uh, can we say that uh, due to the spectral analysis, the fundamental constants of the uh, of the universe in the first one billion years were different? And what is the evidence against it, or what is the evidence for it? Okay. It's an ongoing question actually, this particular thing. Lots of people are interested in it. Lots of people have worked on it and including scientists from Ayuka actually. So you may have heard. Um, there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, interest in indeed knowing whether fundamental constants change with time or not. And at the moment, most of the pieces, all the evidence points to them being constant. So there used, there was in the past one of the claim that with the spectra you can actually probe the fundamental constant and it is changing a little bit. But further studies, especially from the scientists in Ayuka, found that this was not uh, the case. And if you look at all the errors in the analysis and everything, things are uh, sort of stable. But the thing which this intensity mapping will do will provide a very excellent test bed for it. So when I told you about fundamental physics from this intensity mapping, one of the things which they would like to verify is this fundamental constant. Because if suppose there was a difference, you know, between this wavelength and that wavelength, so you have, for example, different uh, epochs, then you can very easily test these kind of things, whether fundamental constants varied with time or not. But at the moment, most of the things are coming towards the same. They're not varying. It's boring, but true. Yeah. So. Yeah, so you have seen how, you know, uh, the research in this subject requires a breadth of expertise, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, <coughs> observation as well, which could be, which can also include a lot of data analysis. And so all these things have to be combined together to, you know, perform and get expertise in this uh, subject, which we are very happy that uh, Hamsa has obtained. And she has also uh, made an effort to basically get it down to a level where all of you can understand and also maybe get inspired by to work in this field, right? So let's thank her uh, again thank for uh, giving us this excellent Thanks talk so with these lovely visuals as well Thanks. and simple expression. Thank you so much. Thanks for a lot. Uh, so we look forward to having more of your talks. Thank you so much. Future. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. And so, uh, of course, uh, I would remind you that we will keep having our lectures. And uh, this is, in fact, uh, there's a common link between a last, a last lecture, one of the last lectures which happened, which is reorganization. And uh, if you want to, if you have missed that lecture, which was by Professor Kanak Saha, you can always go to our YouTube channel and uh, watch it there. We do keep good quality recordings of these lectures on our YouTube channel. Just look up Ayuka SciPop, short for Science Popularization, and you'll be able to get uh, all our past lectures and enjoy them, get uh, more information from them. Uh, so do look it up.
and uh, we'll also ask you to uh, you know look up our social media so that you can get the announcements and uh, <clears throat> other um, tidbits that we share there which will help you uh, know about our uh, upcoming events so with that i would like to uh, conclude the evening here thank you for being such a good audience despite the rain etc we'll see you again at the next lecture thank you so much <laughs>